Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by the Royal Tyrrell Museum, which is located in southern Alberta, Canada. It's one of the top paleontological research institutes in the world. The entire museum is dedicated to the science of paleontology, and it's definitely a must-see for every dinosaur enthusiast. More information can be found at tyrrellmuseum.com. This week, we have a bunch of dinosaur news. Our dinosaur of the day is Argentinosaurus, and we want to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. Yeah, just a reminder, our 100th episode is coming up, and we've got some extra special rewards if you pledge between now and October 21st. Don't worry if you've already pledged to us, you're you're already going to get those extra special rewards. So check out the page at patreon.com slash I know dino. Jumping into the news, there's a new dinosaur that has been named based on a small ornithomimid originally found back in 1934. The work was done by Bradley McFeeders and others, and it was published in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. The specimen they were looking at is called ROM-1790, and it's a partial skeleton of what had been referred to as Struthiomimus atlas for the last 80 plus years. It made sense at the time because it's from Dinosaur Provincial Park, where many Struthiomimus have been found, and it was in 76 million year old sediment, which would have put it in the same time period as Struthiomimus as well. But when they looked in more detail at the skeleton, they found differences in the skull, vertebrae, pelvis, and feet. It's named Ratavates evidence, and Rati comes from ratite birds, including ostriches, and Vates means foreteller. So according to the authors, it, quote, alludes to the paradox of an ostrich mimic that existed before ostriches, end quote. And you might know that ornithomimid means ostrich mimic. So it's kind of funny that, you know, it's mimicking something that's 70 million years younger. <laughs> so they built that into the name of the species. Kind of funny. And evidence comes from evadir, which is Latin for evade since like ostriches that they mimic, <laughs> they were likely fast sprinters and would have run away from conflict. Probably. It was about half the size of a Struthiomimus, and McFeeders and his group believe it wasn't just a juvenile Struthiomimus or other ornithomimid because they sliced a thin section of the leg bone, and they found that it wasn't spongy like a young bone, but rather dense instead, which indicates that it was kind of done growing and was an adult. A co-author, Claudia Schroeder-Adams, used the analogy that if Struthiomimus was like a wolf, then Radovades was like a coyote, where they both coexist with similar diets but at different sizes, even in the same ecosystem. At half the size of Struthiomimus, it's still about the size of an ostrich. They estimate it was about 5 feet or 1.5 meters tall, 11 feet or 3.3 meters long, and weighed about 200 pounds or 90 kilograms. It had a toothless beak and was likely omnivorous, and since it's closely related to Ornithomimus, which was found nearby with a downy coat of feathers, Radovades probably had a similar coat of feathers. So that's a pretty interesting find. It's cool to see a little more diversity in Dinosaur Provincial Park. So, Yeah, good. Just speaking of the coyote and wolf analogy, it's kind of like the Serengeti, where you have all these different kinds of animals that eat slightly different things. They're able to live together. Yeah, or even some of them do eat the same things, but they just behave a little bit differently or are different sizes. And thanks to Chris for sharing this with us on Twitter. There's a new article in Nature's Scientific Reports by Nicholas Edwards and others that expands on what we know about dinosaurs' colors. So we've talked about how eumelanin can be distinguished from pheomelanin by their respective microscopic shapes. And if you don't remember, eumelanin gives both birds and mammals a black or dark brown color, and pheomelanin gives animals a reddish hue. But those two structures are different shapes, so if you look at them under like a scanning electron microscope, you can see the shapes and then kind of guess 
what type of melanin they had and then therefore what color they were. So in case you're wondering, Sabrina's got the eumelanin and I've got the pheomelanin, which means I'm a redhead and she's a brunette. <laughs> but what these researchers did was they went to the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source, which is older and smaller than the European Synchrotron, but still very powerful. And they hit samples with high power x-rays to measure their fluorescence and absorption. So they didn't actually use any dinosaur material in their research, but the intention was to kind of refine the technique so that in the future it could be used with dinosaur material. And they ended up using feathers from two hawks, an owl, and a kestrel, and were able to identify the colors of the feathers with their technique. They found that calcium, copper, and zinc are controlled by melanin content, with eumelanin being the black color, containing more calcium and copper, and that zinc alone corresponds to pheomelanin, or a reddish color. And when you hit these specimens with the really high power x-rays out of the synchrotron, it makes it fluoresce, and then you can test which chemicals are there based on the absorption in the sensitive equipment around it. So it's a really non-destructive way to test specimens for what the chemical composition is. And that works out really well in things like fossils where you don't want to cut into them or maybe they're a little bit damaged so it's hard to get like a good picture of it, but you can fluoresce it a little bit easier. And they hope that this will allow for more accurate and reliable reconstructions of fossil organisms so that say when we're reproducing some paleo art of a dinosaur, it's got all the right colors and the right patterns and things. It's pretty interesting. I hope other people build on the research that they did. Yeah, me too. It'd be good to know more about how dinosaurs looked. Next, we have an update on a piece of news that we shared last week in our last episode. So we talked about a dinosaur that a group of hikers found on top of Mount Coulomb in Queensland, Australia, and how they left the dinosaur with the police because they couldn't find the owner. Well, now, according to news.com.au, a man named Mitch Brooks learned about the missing dinosaur in his Facebook feed, and he recognized the dinosaur as one of the dinosaurs that went missing at the Big Pineapple Music Festival in 2014, though it's still unclear to me why the note on the dinosaur said it had been gone since 2013. But anyway, Mitch was one of the festival's co-organizers, and apparently this missing dinosaur was one of two that was used as a prop on a safari-themed stage. And Brooks said, quote, We reported it to police, so it was a missing persons case. <laughs> there was speculation it ran away to Clive Palmer's nearby dinosaur park, end quote. And Mitch rented the dinosaurs for the festival, but the owners of the dinosaurs decided to let them keep it at Big Pineapple, which is a tourist attraction. Mitch said he thought it was a funny prank, quote, although it's probably not as funny to the real owners. So the person who went to the effort of putting it up there and leaving this hilarious note, well played, end quote. So glad we got that mystery solved. Yeah. I wonder if they just wrote the wrong year on it because they forgot what year exactly it was. Could be. Next, KUER reported on a nine-foot block found in Utah full of Utah raptors, and we've actually talked about this before back in episode 34 in our interview with Dr. Jim Kirkland, and we talked with him about how he and his team have been working hard on excavating these fossils so they can be properly studied, but, you know, it takes a long time to excavate. So the next step is to get more funding for the project. And currently, you can see the rock slab with the Utah raptors in a lab at the Museum of Ancient Life at Thanksgiving Point in Leahy. Next, thanks to Patrick who shared this one with us via Facebook. According to Screed Rant, the next Transformers movie, Transformers The Last Night, will have more Dinobots as well as mini robots who can transform into dinosaurs, which sounds awesome. This is based on a quote from Mark Wahlberg in a video Q&A with fans on Facebook who said it's, quote, a cool new story. It's kind of like a man on the run. Sir Anthony Hopkins is also in the film. We got a cool new cast, cool new robots, cool new villains, and some cool new Dinobots. I think you guys are really going to go crazy for the mini Dinobots. That's funny. Sounds cool, Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, seriously. I, I enjoyed the robots, or the dinosaur ones especially, that were in the most recent Transformers movie. Yeah. They were pretty fun. They were. They were intense. Yeah. Next, according to BBC, an illustrator at Arvin Animations, Henry St. Ledger, turns his biscuit and tea cake wrappers into dinosaur origami. Sometimes on his breaks, he left these wrapper raptors mm -hmm. at a nearby cafe, and then the staff started 
keeping them as a collection. So now Henry has shared photos of his creations on Tumblr, and he's made T-Rexes, pterosaurs, dinosaur eggs, and more. And his colleagues and his brother have also started helping make them for the blog. And the Tumblr blog is called Rapper Raptors, and we'll post a link so you can see for yourself. They're really awesome and really detailed and intricate. And Well, I mean, I'm always impressed by origami anyway, but origami dinosaurs. <laughs> Next, Earth, and that's E-R-T-H, a visual and physical theater company in Sydney that started about 25 years ago has shows that it takes around Australia and the world. And according to Armadale Express, one that is currently making the rounds in Australia is Dinosaur Zoo, which is supposed to be like a live animal presentation, but with dinosaurs. It has puppets, prehistoric sets, and of course, audience interaction. And kids get to help with the show sometimes. And uh, apparently some kids love it. Some kids get scared. Scott Wright, the artistic director, said that uh, quote, a three-year-old could hold their own against a T-Rex, whereas an 11-year-old could freak, end quote. I guess you just don't know. And yeah, it was kind of like that at our wedding, actually, where we had the big T-Rex guy and some of the little kids were, the tiniest kids were okay with it, but then like the medium-sized kids that were a little bit more aware of their own well-being were terrified. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Earth focused mostly on Australian dinosaurs, and they work with people with dance, circus, or puppetry skills. Pretty eclectic. And Dinosaur Zoo is an eight-year-old show, but it's gone through many iterations. So sounds fun if you're in Australia. And last for the news, KCET shared a story about six roadside dinosaur attractions in Southern California. They include Cabazan, where you can see the dinosaurs from Pee Wee's Big Adventure, it's a three-story concrete T-Rex and 150-foot-long apatosaurus built by Claude Bell, who's a theme park artist, and Claude worked on Knott's Berry Farm. He built it to get people to his wheel-in diner next door, which has unfortunately closed and is now a creationist museum. But anyway, there's also Jerupa Mountains Discovery Center in Riverside, which has more than 10 dinosaur sculptures as well as botanical gardens. Dinosaur Swampland in Apple Valley, which was supposed to be a kid's amusement park called Dinosaur Swampland, and it has 36 dinosaurs on four acres of land, and the dinosaurs are made out of stucco wire. There's Peggy Sue's Dinosaur Park in Yermo, which is on the way to Vegas and is a 50s-style diner. Charlie Brown Farms Land of Dinosaurs in Little Rock, which started as a fruit stand in 1929 and now has three buildings and dinosaur statues. And last, California Nursery Specialties in Rosetta, which has dinosaurs that are meant to entice people to the nursery. There's also a bonus site they listed at Borrego Springs in Anza Borrego Desert State Park, where the sculptor Ricardo Brissetta has made metal sculptures of dinosaurs and other animals, and they're very intricate and huge, and I can't imagine how you'd even go about making those, but... Those are the only ones that I've seen out of that whole list, is yeah. the last one. <laughs> maybe one day we'll make it to the others. Yeah, maybe. At least some of them. We'll see. It would be cool to see the dinosaurs from Pee-wee's Big Adventure. I don't think I've ever even seen that movie. Oh, we'll have to watch it. I guess so. Before we get into the dinosaur of the day, we have another word from the Royal Tyrrell Museum. The Royal Tyrrell Museum is one of the largest and most respected paleontology museums in the world. The museum takes you on a journey through time that brings you face to face with some of Canada's mightiest dinosaurs. With nine ever-changing galleries, fun hands-on activities, and the rugged beauty of Alberta's badlands that yield the greatest diversity of dinosaur fossils in the world, there's something for everyone. So we mentioned that find of that Struthiomimus turned Radavates earlier, and it was actually just found about 75 miles or 120 kilometers down the Red Deer River from the Royal Tyrrell Museum. And that's kind of indicative of the area and just how many dinosaurs there are around there. And at the Royal Tyrrell Museum, they have what they call the Encana Badlands Science Camp, and their description is live the dream, which I think is pretty accurate for a lot of kids. I would have been super excited to go do like a real paleontology type dig as a kid at a camp. That would be awesome. So as a kid, if you join this camp, you get to go prospecting and you get to help out the paleontology department with hands-on science projects. And it all kind of takes place in the Badlands Science Camp and you sleep in tents and there are individual camps that are geared towards different age groups. So there's one for ages 9 to 12. There's one for 13 to 16. And then there's one that they call their citizen science family camp. 
And that allows parents to go with the kids. That sounds like the best one. Yeah, definitely. You don't want to just send your kids and then they have all the fun. I know. <laughs> so if you're interested in any of those camp programs, you, yes. can, <laughs> you can go to the TyrolMuseum.com and they have the camp sites there. I think it's probably best to start looking six months to a year in advance because when we were there talking to Cameron about the program, he said they all sell out many months in advance. So That's not surprising. It sounds like a really great program and especially it's so well known. Yeah, definitely. So if you're interested in it, make sure you get in early. And if you're looking to support paleontological research, the museum's membership program supports its scientific research exhibits and education programs and offers unlimited admission to the museum. You can get more information at tyrolmuseum.com, and that's T-Y-R-R-E-L-L museum.com. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, which is Argentinosaurus, and it was a request from Garrett via Facebook. Obviously not this Garrett, different Garrett. Thanks, Garrett. Anyway, the name means Argentine lizard. It's a titanosaur that was found in Argentina, and it's one of the largest known dinosaurs. It lived in the late Cretaceous. Uh, one of the latest largest known dinosaurs is Dreadnoughtus, which we talked about in, I believe, episode 15. And so these kind of giant dinosaurs, we seem to keep finding more and more, though it's hard to pin down exactly how large they were. Yeah, there's a ton of like extrapolation that goes on with these, especially because so many of them are really incomplete finds. So the the range of weights can be like 50 to like 100 tons pretty easily. And then trying to discern which range is the ultimate maximum one is especially hard. Yeah. So Argentinosaurus, the first fossils were found by a rancher in 1987 who thought that a leg was a big piece of petrified wood. And they also eventually found a large vertebra about the size of an adult human male. Yeah. It was described by Jose F. Bonaparte and Rodolfo Coria in 1993, and the type species is Argentinosaurus huianculensis. The holotype only has six vertebrae from the back, five partial vertebrae from the hip area, ribs on the right hip, part of a rib from the flank, and the right fibula. Other Argentinosaurus bones that have been found include an incomplete femur, which combined with the other bones helps scientists estimate its size. The exact size of Argentinosaurus is uncertain. Like we said before, it's hard to tell with these titanosaurs. But one vertebrae was 5.2 feet or 1.59 meters tall, which is very tall. Gregory S. Paul estimated Argentinosaurus to be between 98 and 115 feet or 30 to 35 meters long and weigh 80 to 100 tons. The skeletal restoration at the Museo Carmen Fuenes is 140 feet or 39.7 meters long and 24 feet or 7.3 meters high and has the mostly complete fibula. In 2006, Carpenter estimated Argentinosaurus to be 98 feet or 30 meters long based on Saltosaurus. Other estimates that are based on Saltosaurus... Opisthocolicadia and Rapatosaurus say that Argentinosaurus is between 72 and 85 feet or 22 and 26 meters long. In 2004, Mazetta and others estimated that Argentinosaurus weighed 73 tons. Argentinosaurus is the heaviest known sauropod so far. Another estimate had Argentinosaurus weighing 83 tons, and this is based on the volume of a reconstruction. In 2013, Bill Sellers, Rodolfo Coria, Lee Margrets, and others published a study in PLOS One about Argentinosaurus' speed. They digitally reconstructed Argentinosaurus and estimated its gait and speed with musculoskeletal analysis, and they found it could go as fast as 5 miles per hour, 2 meters per second. They used a laser to scan the skeleton in the Argentine Museum. Argentinosaurus was an herbivore with a long neck that it used to reach up into conifers or sweep the ground for ferns and bushes. Yeah, a lot of the newer stuff is saying that they did more of a sweeping motion and less reaching up high. Yeah, I could see that covering more ground. And there's issues with uh, blood pressure and stuff too. Yeah. So they swallowed gastroliths to grind up the food in their stomachs, and they probably traveled in herds for protection, and juveniles were vulnerable to predators. Fossilized eggs of sauropods related to Argentinosaurus have been found, and it's possible that hundreds of Argentinosaurus adults came together each year to nest on wide, flat floodplains. 
Our so Argentinosaurus is a titanosaur, and titanosaurs are a group of sauropods, which are very large herbivores that lived during the last 30 million years of the Mesozoic era. Some titanosaur species are the largest land-living animals discovered, but in many cases scientists have found incomplete fossils. The name Titanosaur came from the titans of ancient Greek mythology, and the family Titanosauridae was named after Titanosaurus, an incomplete fossil. Only a partial femur and two incomplete caudal vertebrae were found by Richard Lydecker in 1877. Titanosaurs were the last group of sauropods. They lived about 90 to 66 million years ago and were the dominant herbivores. They replaced other sauropods like diplodocids and brachiosaurids. Titanosaur fossils have been found on all continents, including Antarctica. The most titanosaurs lived in the southern continents, which was then part of the supercontinent Gondwana. Compared to other sauropods, titanosaurs had small heads. Their heads were also wide, with large nostrils and crests formed by nasal bones. They had spoon-like or peg or pencil-like teeth that were very small. They were not picky eaters. They had a broad diet, which included cycads and conifers, as well as surprisingly palms and grasses, such as the ancestors of rice and bamboo. They tended to have average length necks, at least for sauropods and whip-like tails, but not as long as the diplodocus tail. Titanosaurs also had a slimmer pelvis compared to some sauropods and wider chests, which gave them a broader stance and they left broader tracks. They had stocky forelimbs that were usually longer than their hind limbs, and they had solid backbones instead of hollowed out backbones. It's interesting. You'd think they would want all of their bones to be as light as possible, but there must have been something important about the backbones. Yeah, could be. And our fun fact of the day is that the world's largest synchrotron, back to synchrotrons, I really enjoy them, is the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, built by CERN from 1998 to 2008, although it's been upgraded from time to time, and now maintains 13 TeV, or tera electron volts, between its two beams. To explain what one TeV is, they say, quote, one TeV is about the energy of motion of a flying mosquito. What makes the LHC is so extraordinary is that it squeezes the energy into the space about a million million, also known as a trillion, times smaller than a mosquito, end quote. So it's not really that much energy per se, but it's really just very energy dense. And then in the LHC, they're trying to collide particles. So they have to be very in very specific places for it to work. The LHC is also 17 miles in circumference. So it's huge. By comparison, the European synchrotron is only six giga electron volts or about one two thousandth the power of the LHC. And it's about a half a mile in circumference. But that's the one that a lot of people, especially in Europe and Africa, go to to do their research on these dinosaur finds with fossils where they need the high power x-rays. And that's still plenty of power. And then the Stanford synchrotron that we were talking about before is only three giga electron volts, which is half the European synchrotron. And it's only about an eighth of a mile in circumference. So even though they're all very powerful, some are much more powerful than others. <laughs> And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you want to get in on uh, the celebrations with the 100th episode, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. For just $1, if you pledge between now and October 21st, we will give you a special shout out in a 100th episode video. And we have other prizes too, like if you also pledge different amounts by October 21st, we will send you a postcard from SVP or a, also a special personalized video from SVP. Lots of cool things with SVP that we can do, which is why the deadline is October 21st. Thanks again. And until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.